I'm Robert Dejaric from Temple University, Japan. Um, first and foremost, welcome to our campus. Um, just a few things. Um, if you have a phone, uh, put it on vibrate or turn it off. Uh, if there's an earthquake, if you're not familiar with Tokyo, the safe thing to do is actually to hide under your seat rather than run because you could be hit by falling objects. And then if we need to evacuate, we have a garden on the other side, uh, which is the safer place around this university. Um, without further ado, I'm extremely happy to introduce my friend and colleague, Richard Salmons, uh, who will uh, lead the discussion. And uh, after his presentation, uh, we'll have our usual uh, Q&A session. So thanks again. So we have sound here. Okay, so the theme today is, uh, is status seeking in contested Asia. And I've left out the term whether it's Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific. But what we're talking about, and sort of the, the hook to get us started, is just last month we had the launch of this um, magnificent new ship in the PLA Navy, the Type 075 amphibious assault ship a ship of enormous size, 35 to 40,000 tons, so equal in size to a, a full-size American amphibious assault ship. Um, it's been built in uh, record time, as with so many vessels in the PLA Navy, uh, the first of what is expected to be three ships of this size. Um, but to put it into context here, that's the launch ceremony, which we sort of timely and gives us something to, to focus the issue on. But to, to show you, this kind of image is very popular on posted by uh, Chinese Navy enthusiasts and watchers and comes through for us to see on Twitter. Um, so this sort of infographic, there's, there's many of this kind that we can, we can find if you follow any of the uh, China, China Navy watchers. Um, but this one is very typical. They've described it as 2020. That, that year might be slightly optimistic, but we're still basically talking about not only the vast number of modern destroyers, some of very large size, um, but also sort of in pride of place, we sort of have successively the eight Type 071 amphibious assault ships, each of uh, 25,000 tonnes, and as we were saying to some people earlier, bearing a remarkable similarity to the French uh, Mistral class, I believe. Uh, as with many Chinese products, it is extraordinarily similar. Um, and of which the China currently has five, three more on the way to make eight. Then in front, in this, in this graphic, we have the three type 075 um, LHD type uh, amphibious assault ships. So with the full, full length decks. And then sort of in in front, we have the two uh, fixed-wing aircraft carriers. Um, of course, there is a third one of them also under construction, but the two exist so far. Um, and uh, as we were noting earlier, not only is we're sort of focused on that we have the eight Type 071s, but it's interesting that uh, just recently Thailand signed a contract to purchase one more for itself. So an interesting development for a a US treaty ally to acquire a Chinese warship of such size. Um, but our fo uh, we could focus for a little bit on the roles of the Type 071s and Type 075. Um, and particularly, I think what I really want to make a theme of tonight is that I think that these amphibious ships, um, which are extremely new, um, have not yet been taken into account in the debate. The debate tends to focus on the aircraft carriers, but I think that in most plausible scenarios, it's the amphibious ships which will make the biggest difference politically. So let's have a bit of a look. Um, here's a, cl a close-up, or sort of a, a good quality image, again, from uh, sort of Chinese Navy watchers, the, the Type 075 with that's uh, sort of the well deck at the back, the full length uh, helicopter deck to carry uh, what would be, I think it was described as um, 
uh, 30 helicopters. Um, and then a size comparison, again, the, the, our helpful China Navy watches um, compare the Type 071, 210 meters, with the Type 075, 224 meters. Um, so 25,000 tons here, and 35 to 40,000 tons over here. Now, I mentioned that this is, these, uh, I think, the center of our political interest. And this is already the case in China itself. Um, that what I'm going to talk about tonight is already capturing the attention of uh, Chinese popular culture. Um, here is the trailer. Just pause, pause for one second. And we need, we need sound. Sorry. Um, so this is just the, the movie trailer for an extremely popular movie uh, that was released in China last year, Operation Red Sea, in which a team of Chinese commandos uh, transported to the Middle East aboard this, these amphibious assault ships, and they rescue Chinese citizens um, with a series of battles that we see in the, in the, in the trailer. Um, so what I... So can we... If we play the trailer, have a look how similar this is to themes which have been the, the substance of Hollywood movie trailers for decades. And now we see that China is, is seeing Chinese, the Chinese military, playing the same role. So, yeah, so that film with a budget of 70 million US dollars and it grossed more than 500 million US dollars in ticket sales. And uh, one part which I've, I've not, I haven't seen the whole movie, but apparently there's a fascinating scene at the very end of this movie where the, the troops are returning on their ships from the Middle East to China. And presumably while passing through the South China Sea, they encounter a flotilla of American warships. And the final scene, I'm, I'm told, uh, involves them warning the Americans, do not enter Chinese waters. And the movie sort of ends on this, on this note. Um, but this is actually the, almost the exact theme of my presentation in the sense that this is a movie supposedly about a humanitarian mission. In this case, the rescue of Chinese nationals. Hopefully in real life, not with all these, this fighting and so on. But this is basically a humanitarian assistance mission. Yet e even the movie directly relates us to the idea of China becoming more assertive and challenging US roles in the Asia Pacific. Um, and that, I think, is actually a real issue, which was is where we translate what we're talking about tonight about humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to the fundamental issues of uh, power shifts and uh, strategic rivalry in our region. So, uh, as I always tell my students, uh, uh, it's not a, uh, a mystery novel, I want to give you the, the, the takeaway uh, right at the start, uh, although I have three, because depending on wh which perspective you're coming from, um, for um, international relations scholars will tend to focus on questions of order building. And this is where, I mean, the, the political science terminology would be that humanitarian assistance disaster relief operations let China play the role of uh, regional order provider. And when I say play the role, that this idea that states uh, adopt roles um, is actually one of the key ideas in, uh, which is quite current in political science at the moment. Um, for those from the policy community, um, sort of a more specific sort of takeaway is that um, the United States and its allies, and I worked in the Australian government for a number of years, um, have emphasised the HADR message for many years now. Uh, it's been a key theme in a lot of um, foreign policy and defence messaging around the region. But what I'm going to say is that this message has created a reality that the provision of things like HADR um, is now seen as a fundamental part of national roles. So that this message has, has created its own reality and this is a reality which China is now has the capabilities and the will to play its part in. So in this narrative, which was originally created by the US and its allies. Um, and for those with the general public and have a general interest in these issues, um, 
probably the best single takeaway is the idea that when we look at things like, a, say, a new Chinese aircraft carrier, let's not think about it fighting in a battle against the United States Navy. What would be much more interesting is to speculate, what if the, the Chinese Navy can replace the United States Navy in its roles in the Asia-Pacific without a fight? So, the outline of the talk tonight is that I'm going to actually start with a focus on one specific event, which was the uh, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. as a single natural disaster in the region, which I'm going to argue set off the regional trend towards this big military role in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. But I'm then going to argue that the impact of the Indian Ocean tsunami was keenly felt in Beijing. That the, uh, the significance of the political benefits of providing the assistance that the US and its allies provided in the Indian Ocean was uh, keenly felt in Beijing, which wanted to then imitate this process. I'm then going to argue that what the new naval forces do for China is to help establish China's status as a major power. And I'll specifically point out that assets like the aircraft carriers are not merely uh, expensive objects for display. That the way they would actually change China's status is through allowing China to play a role as a major power in the region. And then we'll allow some scope for, hy for hypothesizing about what future scenarios would eventuate if uh, China adopts these roles with these new assets. So. Indian Ocean tsunami, which occurred on the 24th of of 26th of December, which is known as uh, Boxing Day in, in many countries. Um, so in Australia and other countries, it's known as the Boxing Day tsunami. Others call it the Indian Ocean tsunami of 26th December um, 2004, which uh, originated from earthquakes in the Indian Ocean and affected numerous countries around the rim of that ocean, but particularly here, in the Indonesian province of Aceh. So I'll refer you to, uh, there's an excellent paper by John Bradford, who many of you will know, uh, which I can, I've got a copy here I can give to you, or I can show, show it to you. It shows an enormous amount of details, the go-to paper on uh, the United States response to the Indian Ocean tsunami. But to summarize it, it the US response, under a major operation under the Pacific Command uh, operation, uh, unified assistance brought together six countries. Uh, the US alone deployed 25 ships, um, this large number of personnel and aircraft. Australia deployed several hundred troops. Uh, Japan sent ships and, and troops of its own. Singapore, an amphibious ship, and so on. And particularly, December 2004 was in the midst of the, the era of the global war on terrorism. Uh, not long after the invasion of Iraq. And it, it meant that this operation had a significant political effect. Um, it uh, paved the way in Aceh towards a peace settlement, but it also provided a significant boost to American soft power. Soft power being defined by Joseph Nye as the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payment. So at the time, due to the Iraq war, attitudes towards the United States were not favorable in Indonesia. But as well as uh, in polls taken by the Pew Research Institute uh, from the year before the tsunami and the year after the tsunami, uh, Indonesian attitudes um, 
as to whether America took into account the interests of a country like Indonesia, uh, doubled. Uh, those who believed that the tsunami aid had improved their impression of America zoomed to 79%. Now, and there's many more polls and so on which indicate a remarkable turnaround in attitudes in, in Indonesia towards the United States. Now, what I want to emphasize, though, is that we may, we may uh, debate whether or not soft power exists, um, whether it counts for anything. But what I think is the important point is that the United States said it did. So, for example, uh, Admiral Fallon, the then head of uh, the Pacific Command, testified to Congress to say that, what did he say? He said that our experience with the 2004 Indonesian tsunami relief effort revealed the tremendous influence of Department of Defense-led humanitarian operations in reinforcing a positive view of the US. And there are many more such examples. So what I'm going to emphasize is that from the point of view of other countries in the region, it's not a question of whether or not this soft power existed. It's the fact that the United States said it existed, which, was, um, which means that it matters from the point of view of claiming that they had achieved a significant um, political victory. So partly as a result, or particularly as a result of the Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, HADR started to become sort of a large trend throughout the region. And it's true that the Asia Pacific region is prone to natural disasters due to tsunamis, tropical storms, floods, and so on. And also urbanization and population growth um, are in disaster prone regions. But the Indian Ocean tsunami drew policymakers' attention squarely towards the strategic aspects of HADR. So uh, most would follow this list, which is firstly that HADR is a way of signaling uh, particularly American commitment to the region. It justifies the US maintaining forward deployed forces. And it gives a, a valuable public justification for new deployments and new presence. For example, HIDR was widely cited as an official reason for the US Marine presence in Northern Australia. Also, HADR is an excellent way for a state to demonstrate its capabilities because um, being able to uh, carry out a large-scale HADR operation demonstrates the ability to project power and conduct sophisticated operations at long distance. And it is also a, an avenue for practical ties and... Um, uh, coalition building. Um, particularly, uh, while it is, there is a large uh, number of multinational exercises, it's also a particularly useful way of allowing cooperation between non-traditional partners. Uh, so many people would give the example of, say, the United States and Vietnam, that uh, were not normally uh, defence partners, but HRDR provides a politically neutral way in order to open up new avenues of engagement. So, so with this in mind, what I want to turn to is the impact of this regional trend in Beijing. So, I've basically sort of summarised here some Chinese priorities uh, perhaps I would have sort of put sort of the time period, sort of around this period from 2004 over perhaps um, you know, the decade or so after that. That especially, although it's, we sometimes will lose track of it looking at sort of the current uh, Xi era, previous to the Xi presidency, China was still uh, considering itself to be vulnerable. Uh, events such as the invasion of Iraq 
or the intervention in Kosovo, um, created anxiety in Beijing with the feeling that uh, the US still enjoyed the benefits of its you know, unipolar strength and was willing to intervene in sovereign countries, including on humanitarian pretexts. So there was a strong belief in China that China's efforts to increase its own strength ran the risk of being self-defeating if it only encouraged hostile coalitions against China. It was necessary for China to emphasize that it was rising to become a legitimate major power. So this defensive outlook still prevailed in 2005 when uh, interviews by uh, Andrew Erickson and Andrew Wilson from the US Naval War College indicated sort of an intensive debate in China over the role of aircraft carriers. In, uh, officials that Erickson and Wilson interviewed said that the 2004 tsunami had definitely changed uh, Chinese attitudes towards uh, the usefulness of aircraft carriers. And they described the need to acquire aircraft carriers as a way to diversify China's Navy. Now it is true that as far back as the 1970s, Chinese naval leaders had talked about an aircraft carrier capability. China had acquired some old hulls like the old Australian aircraft carrier Melbourne. Um, but it was only after the tsunami in 2006 and 07 that Chinese officials began to publicly state that China had begun an aircraft carrier program. So Eric, Ericsson and Wilson's research highlights that um, China was particularly concerned about the significant roles that regional rivals were playing in the area of HADR. And one, one quote from them is that what even a modest carrier can do caught the Chinese by surprise in early 2005 when they watched in horror as Indian and Japanese carriers conducted post-tsunami relief operations. So that was soon followed by articles, for example, in the PLA Navy official publications saying that the Indian Ocean tsunami abundantly illustrates the use of armed forces not only to prevent conflict and wage wars, but to play key actions of national construction, disaster relief, and rebuilding. And around the same time, acquisition of aircraft carrier became a popular cause in China. So scholars such as Robert Ross have listed the enormous number of pro-aircraft carrier sort of campaigns in China. Uh, one of which we can see here that this is not in fact a ship at all. This is a building constructed in Pudong, that is sort of Greater Shanghai, which is just a concrete building with a sort of a solar panel farm on top, which is sort of being built in the exact shape of an aircraft car. It's not even a ship at all. It's simply a, it's a concrete building. And there are numerous others such as this, uh, members of the public offering to donate their own money to the construction of an aircraft carrier. Uh, mass market sales of the book, uh, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by Mahan. Uh, the, the popularity of the former Soviet carrier Minsk, which was tied up in Shenzhen as a tourist attraction. And talk shows on Chinese television and so on. So Ross, for example, emphasizes that in this, such a nationalistic environment, it was difficult for Chinese leaders to defer the construction of an aircraft carrier without degrading their nationalist credentials. So we could see sort of both international and domestic pressures upon the regime in China, both of which were coming out of the high profile of aircraft carriers in the 2004 tsunami. So to move directly to how this relates to the idea of national status. Now, what I'm arguing is that uh, aircraft carriers and these amphibious capabilities 
are ways that China could establish its status as a legitimate major power. And I think the key here is that adopting, a, uh, acquiring this status is primarily achieved by acting in the role of a legitimate major power. And that the, the insight is that the assistance operations in 2004 were so visible and so widely acclaimed across the region that they showed that HDR was a uniquely effective way of boosting perceptions about the state's national status. But first, in sort of explaining the status issue, I'd first sort of set aside a misconception that aircraft carriers are necessarily uh, simply a form of conspicuous consumption. There is a, a very good book on this topic about uh, conspicuous consumption and international status seeking. But I'm arguing that the role that we see this new navy in China is, is different from that role. It is true that some countries have acquired aircraft carriers purely for reasons of uh, conspicuous consumption. Examples such as Brazil, which acquired a, an old French aircraft carrier and I think uh, held it for about 18 years without it ever being fully operational. Um, Thailand has an aircraft carrier, which again plays little uh, substantive military role. Um, that may be true. Um, but uh, we, could, we could also say that there's, for everyone who says that a, acquiring a, a vessel such as an aircraft carrier would be a good way to show off one's wealth, there's just as much of an argument to say that other countries could simply disparage its value. So a purely symbolic acquisition, I think, is of little net benefit. And probably the only thing that it will show off is similar to um, if, you, if, you're, if your intention of your acquisition was purely to show off an asset for, um, uh, for, st for status-seeking reasons alone, um, that would be no different from other activities such as hosting the Olympic Games or launching a space program, which in the case of China would do little more than show that China was a wealthy nation. But that is a superfluous um, a need. Everybody knows that China is already a, a, a wealthy nation. Uh, so the actual significance of these aircraft carriers and ships comes from their operational roles. And what we're basically arguing is that um, uh, having uh, this new navy able to carry out these HADR roles um, allows China to perform the functions of a major power. So that many would say that there are, uh, international security tends to be dominated by the club of great powers. So for example, the United Nations Security Council um, clearly distinguishes between states that are expected to be the providers of international security and those that require uh, security assistance. China, which is itself a permanent UNSC member, has been keenly aware of the need to earn its legitimacy by supporting international institutions, the United Nations, arms control treaties, um, and even such things as say, uh, perhaps this was in a, in a previous um, political era, but when China joined the uh, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was actually at a short-term cost to its military capabilities. Now, a key aspect of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief is that it sends a uniquely strong message that the state is carrying out the roles of a legitimate major power. So, what we would ask ourselves is what kind of activity or what kind of event is powerful enough to shift international perceptions of a matter such as national status, um, a value which tends to be quite sticky. Uh, nations become established for some kind of status and they tend to keep it for a long time. 
So what is powerful enough to shift attitudes? So we could argue that the use of naval task forces in humanitarian assistance missions, such as Operation Unified Assistance, or as we saw later in uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, uh, first of all, they are very public. They are events that attract the, the world's news media. Uh, they are much more visible than the normal routine of the military's activities. They are dramatic in the literal sense that a great human drama is unfolding with the loss of life, casualties, or the rescue and saving of people in a natural disaster. And they are also unambiguous in the sense that they demonstrate very exact uh, strategic capabilities. Like we said, if a state is able to deploy a naval task force uh, over long distances and carry out, say, uh, ship-to-shore relief operations, then it has demonstrated a powerful military capability. So one reason why we can say this is a status-shifting activity is because it not only generates your own knowledge that this state has engaged in this activity and has these capabilities, but it also uh, ensures that you know that other people know that the state has demonstrated these capabilities, which is kind of one of the keys to the idea of status shifting. And the example which I, I used uh, in my doctoral research, I compared uh, um, perceptions of status to a Rolls-Royce car. Now it happens, I think, in Hong Kong, well, it's probably a bad example to give at the moment, but there's a hotel in Hong Kong which has a fleet of green Rolls Royces to ferry its uh, well-to-do uh, guests around the city. Now, the thing is that you and I may feel that a Rolls Royce is a silly car. Bad value for money, doesn't go that well. Many, many other cars may be better than a Rolls Royce. But the fact is that we don't actually have to think that it is a good car. And I don't even have to think that, feel that you think that it's a good car. We just have to know that most people assume that it's a good car. So in that sense, people will call this a second order belief or a general belief, uh, that what matters is not your own personal opinion of the matter, but it's what your assessment of the general opinion amongst the relevant community is of the matter. So what we could argue is that if HIDR is a successfully status-shifting event, the actual benefit in the end of gaining higher international status is that we could argue that it gives um, a expectation that states will be more likely to defer to China's interests. That is to say that um, Beijing doesn't require every other state to believe that it deserves major power status. It only needs other states to be aware of the deference in general that other states are offering to China. So that is all that Beijing needs to use its status to influence other states because these other states will be mindful of the general deference that is being given to China. So the key, therefore, is that China can help to gain its major power status by carrying out activities that receive the widest possible recognition as being appropriate of a major power. And the use of um, the Navy to provide HADR is one of these. So we're just about out of time, so I'll sort of finish up. Um, the implications. Um, when we talk about humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, um, certainly it will be fascinating to wait to see what will happen in the next large-scale natural disaster, particularly in Southeast Asia, where some of these new ships may appear. Um, but remember that this category of HADR also includes things like the citizen evacuation, which uh, is the subject of the movie, but in real life, 
In 2011, China evacuated citizens from Libya. In 2015, they evacuated citizens from Yemen. Um, then we also asked the question, what will be the greater political implications if, uh, say, a Chinese amphibious uh, task force centered around some of these large ships is on routine patrol on a regular basis, say, throughout the Pacific Ocean region, visiting the small island countries, visiting, small, uh, visiting the region, perhaps on a continuous patrol. Uh, if they've got enough vessels there, say, to conduct continuous routine patrols, what will be the effect for the politics of the region? Secondly, in terms of these status-given roles, um, the role of the provider of uh, regional security has been in the hands of the US and its allies for as long as we can remember. But what if the United States and its allies are no longer the monopoly provider? What if we have a major disaster and, say, the... PLA Navy is the first on the scene and is the first providing this assistance. Um, will the Chinese Navy be required to give way to um, US or allied uh, forces? Or who will resolve the way that things would work? And I think sort of the long-term implication is the way that um, this would contribute to China being able to challenge the overall story of US primacy in the region. That this notion of American primacy is associated with a US-led order in the region. What if instead, if China is able to provide all of the international public goods, such as security, assistance, humanitarian relief, that the US traditionally provided, so that there would, in effect, spring up a second order, a Chinese-led order in the Asia-Pacific region, which would be an order based on all the normal practices of legitimate major powers, the provision of these public goods. But necessarily, if it was a Chinese-led order, it would be according to Chinese rules. Which leads to the final quote, which I mentioned at the start, from Sam Rogovin from the Lowy Institute in Australia. Um, he said in a, in a great report, which I recommend to you, China's carrier-centred navy is not designed so much to challenge US maritime supremacy as to inherit it. At which point I'll finish. Any questions or comments? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm a ma second year master's student at Waseda University, researching the maritime security architecture in the East and South China Sea, and in particular looking at the roles of coast guards. And my question is, your assumption that China sort of adopts what uh, the United States have been doing as a regional power, and that sort of has a zero-sum image to it, but some people are considering whether it's possible to co-op Chinese HADR efforts into a more larger regional multilateral uh, framework. Do you think that's possible? Or do you see any challenges? One example I had was maybe in the Indian Ocean where I know right now China and the Indian Navy, uh, the diplomatic situation is not good, but there's possibilities for cooperation there too. So I was looking, seeing whether there was possibilities for multilateral uh, cooperation. What, what I would probably try to do is distinguish between sort of the, the formal uh, surface aspects of uh, sort of the, uh, say, these official HADR cooperative mechanisms, uh, exercises, uh, meetings, sum uh, summits, and, and so on, which are, which are a perfectly fine part of the regional political slash security architecture. And that the more China is involved in that, the better. I mean, you know, the, the, it is, HIDR is still a perfectly uh, uh, effective way to encourage general uh, architecture building 
across the region. But I think the distinction that I would make is this sort of uh, role shifting, status shifting that I'm talking about is kind of uh, separate to you know, formal mechanisms. This is based on people's actual perceptions of the strategic capabilities, intentions and roles of a major power. Um, so for example, suppose you mentioned the Indian Ocean, that um, suppose, if you gave an example, it might be suppose there was a, a completely cordial China-India link up on counter piracy. Um, and as part of that, China deploys its, its aircraft carrier, which may be perceived as, as being modest next to a US aircraft carrier, but it's pretty good compared with an Indian one, and certainly pretty good next to a pirate ship, or, or you know, a pirate boat, as they are. Um, that on, on one hand, that's perfectly fine China-India cooperation, which, which is always a good thing. On the other hand, if it, if it spectacularly involves a Chinese carrier battle group sailing to the Indian Ocean and conducting real life, you know, sort of realistic uh, long distance training exercises, that shows off sort of an ocean spanning military capability. And that is the sort of thing which would shift people's attitudes towards the, the role of China. Um, so I think the two things happen at the same time, but I'm really interested in how this would affect people's real beliefs about China. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is uh, Hiroaki Kato, a senior research fellow in the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies and part-time lecturer at the uh, National Defense Academy of Japan. Uh, my question is about the actual uh, capability for uh, the, uh, the, of the Chinese Navy to AG uh, DIA. Uh, the, the, I, I totally agree with you, uh, your presentation and uh, the disaster relief mission or uh, other uh, p uh, mission uh, has a soft power. For example, the uh, Eastern uh, Great East uh, uh, Japan uh, earthquake uh, and, uh, and uh, increase to the strength and uh, uh, especially the Tomodachi operation and uh, the strength to the Japanese US uh, allies or the relationship. And uh, the the from the, your, your presentation, uh, I think so too. That Chinese Navy has uh, air, air, air carrier or the amphibious ships. But the, my question is the actual uh, capability. The, uh, the the U.S. Navy or the Japan or the other uh, Western countries uh, conduct the uh, multilat uh, multilateral uh, exercise with the Southeast Asia countries and uh, uh, other the multilateral missions with uh, uh, other navies. The, but uh, Chinese navies, uh, my question is, uh, and the, and the, uh, is there the how, uh, Chinese missions conduct that the exercise or the Chinese Navy has uh, capability to conduct the multinational uh, operations? Thank you very much. Uh, so this is, this is one where um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have comments from uh, naval experts about the, the time frame that is required to bring a major new warship like a Type 075 ship from basically its status of being launched through to being part of a fully operational uh, task force, um, which would be a period of many years. Uh, it's certainly been the case for China's aircraft carriers. Um, so we've, you know, it's several years now since the commissioning of China's first aircraft carrier, but this is a, um, this is a skills building process. Um, I think there would be probably probably a couple of things to su to suggest that while we 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 do need to be realistic about the number of years that it will take to not only have the ability to sail the vessel but the ability to operate it as part of a large operational group, um, whether an aircraft carrier or an amphibious vessel, um, particularly when China, uh, say unlike Australia, which has very recently acquired. Um, uh, two LHDs, but uh, Australia can tap into its deep cooperation with the United States. 
that you know, Australian officers have been on exchange with American amphibious forces for years. Um, and there's the, uh, the resources are available to build that capability quickly. China must do it all itself. Um, I think there are only two things which I would say um, as uh, not being a, a naval member. But uh, one is that to carry out the H-8 operations may not require the ability to conduct full-scale combat operations. It may simply be necessary, all that may be required is to be able to show a presence um, because a lot, much of this is the, the site of the arrival of the ships off the shores of the you know, tsunami-wracked country. Um, so for a, for a period of time there may be the ability to merely appear even with limited actual operational capability. Um, secondly, in terms of the ability to appear at long distances, uh, it is fascinating to see the, uh, the expanded scope of Chinese naval uh, training, that um, uh, ships are conducting exercises at very long distances now uh, beyond the first island chain, deep into the central Pacific Ocean and south of Indonesia towards the Timor Sea and so on. So, um, certain, and this is in very, very recent years. So, um, the I mean, one aspect that I'll point out as a political scientist rather than as a naval expert is the fact that China is building this capability with very deep pockets. We, we have a contrast here with, say, the Soviet Union, which built many uh, very impressive looking warships, but had very little money to operate them fully. China has the, um, the financial resources to not only construct, but operate these vessels. So that the expanded range of these uh, maneuvers, I've seen many reports, some recent reports showing sort of the track of the uh, of, Ch of Chinese um, uh, naval detachments, you know, into the Pacific Ocean, sort of um, starting from, um, so starting from the Chinese mainland, passing through the Ryukyu Islands, into the Central Pacific, down through Indonesia, back up through the South China Sea, sort of cutting through the Taiwan Strait. But this indicates that China is prepared to spend the money required to to build a genuine operational capability. So, I, so I think we we are talking about something which is quite different for say the the old Soviet Navy, which spent most of its time in port because they had no money to send it to sea, while China is, is building this and appears to have the resources to make it operational. Thank you for speaking. My name is Yasu Mori. I'm, I'm not, I have nothing to do with political science except I studied uh, a little bit in, in, at college. But my, uh, I do have a question. Um, HADR sounds very good, especially for the United States, always very global, you know, uh, and you know, military force, but in 2004, you know, they, that, that helped them into HADR, which I think makes sense. But China is clearly, on the, especially on the Xi, right, is clearly belligerent. And so I think my impression is to do HADR, you need to have a powerful force and then subsidiarily help that. How do you, so how long do you think really people are going to start thinking about China is offering HADR because you always, something happens, they'll come in and then they might, they might not leave. At least I would feel that way. Uh, I'd just like to hear your opinion on that. Mm. No, that's it. That's, this is exactly the question which we, we should ask. Uh, I mean, I'd, um, I, I published a paper on Typhoon Haiyan um, in which um, Japan received similar soft power gains uh, from its contribution to, um, to the disaster in the Philippines, uh, while China was, was widely criticised for its non-contribution. Um, but at the same time, we could have asked the question that, say, uh, the disaster takes place in the Philippines, uh, with traditional close ties to, particularly to the US and, and to Japan. So a US task force arrives with you know, a, a, an, a, an attack aircraft carrier. Um, but this is considered perfectly acceptable because it's the United States. Uh, Japan arrives also with a carrier, or the helicopter carrying destroyer, of course we should call it. Um, uh, it arrives, but of course that's acceptable because it's Japan. Um, what if these vessels had been around then? And China arrives with sort of a large carrier group saying, well, we're, we're here to help. 
you know, um, what would be the reaction in these countries? Um, so it leaves us sort of with um, um, the question of, is this, um, uh, is it going to be of equal value to all countries? Or does it require some sort of uh, base of positive soft power? Um, or is, could it be the, an example where um, a country um, tries to um, uh, sort of overreaches and, and it is sort of a, uh, it, it, it finds its, its presence um, uh, backfires on itself um, from, uh, because of sort of negative perceptions ab ab about the country. Hi, I'm Caitlin Dornboss. I'm a reporter for Stars and Stripes, and I'm also pursuing my master's in de defense and strategic studies. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think would mark that shift from the US to China in China's mind? Um, obviously, having power over the region, but what does that actually look like? And is it their intention to kind of wait out US's interest in this region um, if they're only going to play the HADR role? Um, you know, we often hear of them playing the long game. So is that accurate? Uh, the measure which some people will employ is to ask whether China can raise the costs to the US of maintaining its primacy in this region. Um, so, I mean, certainly if we were talking only about HADR, there would be scope for, um, uh, it, it doesn't need to be a zero sum. Uh, both the US and China and other countries can all participate. Uh, it doesn't necessarily detract from the other. But um, if China's new navy was playing a sort of the... If, the follow, if, 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 if what followed from that, from China demonstrating its, uh, its role as a major power in the region, to then building on that legitimacy to say that it should be the primary security provider in the region, um, what would be the point where the resources that China can apply to its, its, its military build-up simply become too great uh, for the US to want to take the risk of uh, engaging it. Um, I mean, most people think that for many years to come, the US would still have a substantial, um, a substantive ability to win a direct conflict. Um, but the costs of winning that conflict go up every year. Um, and so what is the stage where Washington decides that it's no longer worth the risks of, for example, defending Taiwan? And so these capabilities what they, what we're saying is that they, because they demonstrate strategic capability, um, the the actual assistance, the humanitarian roles itself, uh, don't end the U.S.'s presence. But if they um, send a strong enough message that China has overwhelming force available to it within this immediate region. Um, what effect does that have on calculations that are made back in Washington? So, for example, if HADR over the years to come is a way that China could ultimately, I think, and to answer the other question to some degree, we, we might only throw forward 10 years. And it, it would, it would, in 10 years, we might expect China to have fully operational capabilities for all of these vessels. Um, that if a series of these disasters or maybe citizen rescue operations or various other, uh, perhaps also the role, which I didn't, haven't mentioned tonight, but say uh, if there was sort of riots and upheavals in a small Pacific Island country, that China arrives with amphibious group to land Marines to restore order, uh, for example. Um, that uh, those sorts of roles, if over the course of a decade, China uses those as the way without having to fire any shots, so certainly no shots at the US, that it is fully operational it is fully competent and capable in operating uh, advanced and sophisticated uh, armed forces. Um, that um, in 10 years, I mean, don't forget that the, the US 
will continue to advance, particularly in terms of new technology will become available and so on. The US will not become a weak power, but the Washington must always make a calculation as to whether, say, the defense of Taiwan is worth the risks. Um, and so I think many of my old colleagues in Australia would say that they put a sort of a line around 2030 as saying that the US simply would not be able to defend Taiwan after 2030. Um, so that will be sort of, you know, that's a sort of, this is where that relates to this power transition issue. My name is Tung from Vietnam News Agency. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, so uh, my question is, in recent months, yeah, China has uh, a series of unilateral activities on South China Sea uh, that uh, uh, violate the international law, including UNCLOC, the law of uh, sea, and also uh, uh, hinder some uh, legal activities, oil and gas activities by Vietnam and other uh, um, coastal countries in Southeast Asia. So uh, it's uh, may contrary to the uh, their uh, efforts to uh, make uh, 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 new image mm -hmm. of the uh, China Chinese Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think that uh, China uh, will succeed in uh, in their efforts to seek uh, a new status in the regions mm -hmm. when they uh, have uh, uh, many assertive uh, and illegal actions yes. in the regions? Thank you very much. Yes. No, th thanks, Dong. Uh, thanks very much for coming along tonight. It's um, it's an excellent question, um, but the way the the key to answering it, I think, is that. Um, When we talk about uh, China b t taking the role, well, actually, I'll, I'll go, sorry, I'll go back a step. That uh, I should always in my slides put it. I think now it's nowadays it's necessary to put huge years on to say that the period where China was most conspicuously concerned about its legitimacy is certainly in a sort of a pre-Xi period. But we're talking about sort of the two, around the 2004 period where this was still very much alive, and certainly true that the we were having a discussion earlier today where. I mean, I, I, the best word I could use was unvarnished to describe the, 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 the Xi Jinping approach to China's international image. That um, previous concerns about you know, hiding and biding and uh, becoming a, a responsible major power and, and so on, a, res a responsible stakeholder and so on, have all gone out the window. Uh, it is a uh, sort of a, a, a harsher face that China presents now. And we've seen the, re the reactions to this in in terms of, say, the new Cold War talk from, from Washington, for example. Um, but even in the context of this more unvarnished face, um, what I feel is an important point is that to rise to become a legitimate major power, the term legitimacy, I think, can be seen a number of ways. Um, that it may be possible for a state, such as China, that it, it does not need to be necessarily liked by other countries. Um, it need only demonstrate that it is capable of providing the essential international public goods, such as international security. Uh, in this sense, the role could be similar to the rise of the United States, where the United States was prepared in, in the years of its rise to intervene in many smaller countries. There may have been many small countries that were critical of US policy. Um, yet the US was established as a, um, was legitimized as a major power because of the fact that it was actually carrying out those roles. And I mean, in that, that sense, you could be saying we're, we're sort of going back to sort of traditional ideas of, you know, like in European great power politics where um, you know, sort of your, your traditional ethics and morality weren't a big factor in international relations, but it was the fact that states provided a role in providing um, stability and power balancing and so on. Um, so that is a sense of legitimacy. And um, China might, might be able to uh, pursue both tracks, both what has become a far more 
assertive approach to the South China Sea, a far more unilateralist approach to the South China Sea, despite the fact that this um, casts aside some of its, uh, its previous attempts to present a non-threatening face. Um, but at the same time, if it is able to um, demonstrate ever greater capability to be the major provider of security in the East Asian region, then that would still, uh, still gain it its, um, its legitimacy. Uh, Thomas Sullivan, Richard, thank you very much for your talk. I wanted to ask you um, specifically about the HADR aspects for Taiwan and Japan. Taiwan is often mentioned as being one of the countries that could be most impacted by, for example, climate change. Um, and Japan, obviously, after the latest typhoon, um, you know, re realizes that it's now extremely vulnerable to these types of disasters as well. Just wondering, when do you think it might become acceptable for Taiwan or Japan to accept Chinese help um, uh, in, in that regard? Um, and um, do you think China, there's, is there a risk that China might use a disaster as a pretext, for example, uh, for invading Taiwan? Is that a is that a possible um, is that a possible risk? So I've never actually thought of that one, um, but I suppose the question would be: It is still, though, a very serious question that, in the event of a say a major like the Taipei earthquake or some event such as that, um, we would expect to see uh, um, ships of international navies appearing in in Taiwan to offer assistance. So the United States and Japan and other countries that, that have usually been the providers, like Australia, may well be present. And so we have to, I think the, the big question is, um, on, what, on what logic would, uh, would Taiwan simply exclude China from offering purely humanitarian assistance? China will arrive at the 12 nautical mile limit or something like that with its ships bearing goods in the, in the offer of assistance. Um, and it would, be quite, it would be very deliberate about this, of course, that uh, they would say, Yo, look, our, our, our weapons are unloaded, our, our ships are, you know, we, do not see, we, we are loaded merely with humanitarian supplies, and so on. Um, and so they would really be to, uh, to deliberately force uh, Taiwan to exclude them, uh, and, or, uh, and, and similarly to put uh, political pressure upon countries, upon, a, say, Taiwan. Um, so, um, I mean, Taiwan is probably the ultimate case where they can probably always say that they wouldn't really want to have Chinese warships entering their waters. But it's a very, a very real question for, for, me, for many, many of these other Southeast Asian nations, uh, like the Philippines. Um, what, what, uh, what logical basis would the Philippines use to exclude China from what would be uh, is presented as a is simply doing what all these other countries are doing. We're, we're, we're simply joining in what they've accepted from numerous other countries. Why not China? You know, and um, I think that you know, for probably for almost everyone except Taiwan, uh, it would it poses a, a real question for them. You know, would they have any reason that they could say China should not do it? And if then they allow China to do it, what additional role are they letting China play? Um, good evening. My name is Rodolfo Maggio, and I am an anthropologist currently working as postdoctoral researcher at Waseda University. And I've just submitted a couple of um, research proposals for studying the role of China in the South Pacific. And um, I'm particularly interested in the way in which China is changing the perception of the Pacific space as a, a space of sovereignty. Um, there has been a huge debate about the Luganville Wharf in Vanuatu, which was built with Chinese money, and uh, uh, some uh, have argued that it can accommodate um, naval vessels, Chinese naval vessels. And um, but obviously, um, in order to have the the um, legitimacy to distribute its naval vessels around the Pacific, there are a number of steps that we have to watch out for. And I was wondering if you could explain to me uh, what these steps could be in order to uh, gain more uh, legitimacy as a, uh, as, as a legitimate player in the, in the South Pacific or in the Central Pacific. Thank you. Well, I was thinking that, um, like I, I, I noted in one of the slides that one of the great strategic roles of HADR is as an avenue for allowing access to a region. And 
in the case of the South Pacific, it could be such things as agreements regarding, say, these, these newly constructed port facilities and so on, that they would be uh, available for humanitarian purposes. And then you could build up uh, uh, connections such as, say, having warehouses of supplies uh, in place. Um, and then maybe a series of sort of institutionalised um, HADR exercises involving those countries. Um, so, I mean, it allows an, an abundant avenue for uh, cooperation and then an increased presence in, in a region. Um, I mean, an example would be um, what if China offers the chance that when it's, uh, uh, you know, the Type 075 is available, um, that it would arrive and conduct a, a, a full-scale exercise, you know, landing uh, the troops, uh, helicopters, landing craft and so on. Uh, in order to bring supplies ashore and conduct sort of a full-scale ADR exercise in a small Pacific Island country. Um, of course, that exercise uh, involves testing almost the same skills as an amphibious invasion. Um, so, um, you know, this is the sort of scope that would exist. Um, uh, and then there was the aspect which I, I was mentioning that um, it's... Uh, you know, it's well established that the, the US usually has four sort of deployed amphibious um, sort of uh, uh, amphibious uh, task forces that, um, you know, sail around particular, you know, they sail the oceans on a regular basis uh, from home ports which are, you know, in this region. Um, so that once China has its three Type 075s, its eight Type 071s, that gives quite a capability to have, say, one task force on say a regular rotation, sort of a regular cruise through the South Pacific countries, um, perhaps you know through the Indian Ocean. Um, so there will basically be a regular presence in the region. Uh, it would become quite routine for it to dock in a small, a small island nation, take on supplies, maybe do a few local training activities, keep on sailing uh, until it's simply established as a presence. Richard, thanks. You you said something. I very much agree with you that. China doesn't necessarily need to be loved or liked. I mean, Machiavelli said, if you have to choose between being feared and loved, ideally you would like both, but sometimes you can't, and it is much better to be feared than loved because men always remember what they fear than sometimes forget what they love. So there's a certain logic to this. But I'd like to go beyond this, the question of allies, and it's tangential to your presentation, but still related to it. Uh, if you think of most great global powers, and of course there've been very few in the history of the world because of technology, but you think of the UK, you think of the US later, uh, what made them extremely powerful was that they had a set of allies or partners. I mean, the UK did not have formal alliances, but had a set of countries that were aligned at least partially with its interests. Uh, how is this related to the, ch is there a Chinese quest for allies? or just a Chinese quest for power? Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, weigh those two as, as, as opposites. But what I would say is that somebody I noticed was, was, talk, was talking about the current US administration and its, its approach to traditional US allies, which was, and was saying this is, this is a, the approach is wrong because the fundamental basis of US power is its, its, its exceptional network of allies around the world. And I thought this was actually, this is not true. The, the fundamental basis of US power is US wealth, technology and military strength. That is the basis for US power. And then alliances are a means by which uh, a, a superpower such as the US extends its power internationally. So. I mean, I would say that the, you know, the, the basis of Chinese strength is Chinese wealth. Um, and that if China is able, as part of uh, its, um, its inevitable international expansion, as part of a, uh, if it's a economic power of global scale, which requires global reach, then it would build a network of partners um, but it's still a question as to whether it needs any actual allies. I mean, uh, you know, the, the great international relations scholars like uh, 
um, Kenneth Waltz or John Mearsheimer, they would say that in an environment of superpowers, um, allies are irrelevant because they contribute nothing to the balance of power. Um, that uh, all that matters is the internal strength of China and that if it can use partners as, you know, for whatever it needs them for, for sea lanes, for the source of supplies, resources and so on, then it can do that without necessarily needing to enter into formal alliances. Um, I mean, we'd have to ask, you know, are there any allies that would make a, um, a material difference to the US-China power balance? But it's, but it's, but, well, I suppose, if, yes, if it's, but it's unlikely to join the Chinese side, I think. So, out of any country which China is likely to bring on board as an ally, um, tell me, what, what are they? Dr. Salmons, thank you for the uh, great presentation. I, uh, I totally agree with you that um, China will have a capability to conduct those operations. And I'm sure that they will try to enhance their status by doing HADA. But in reality, though, I think about, about those countries that might benefit from H, those Chinese HADA. I just can't see in some of the countries, you know, really appreciating and um, uh, respect Chinese assistance that some, someone said before, uh, in those countries, people fear Chinese enhanced presence. Like think about Asia Pacific region, with Japan, Australia, Taiwan, and Vietnam. You know, of course, those countries like Pakistan or <coughs> Cambodia, they are willing to accept and um, appreciate those operations, of course, but uh, if China, Chinese politics, political system is out as it is now, and if it doesn't change, then I don't, I don't know how China can enhance, en enhance its image and status by conducting HADA. Mm -hmm. You know, China has difficulties accommodating mm -hmm. Hong Kong, mm. its own territory. You know, so I have this question. Uh, this is a totally fair question, and I can give two answers, possibly. One is, uh, remember that under our umbrella of HRDR, it's not just natural disasters, but also um, the, the term humanitarian assistance also covers, say, the citizen, citizen uh, recovery. Uh, that is, these incidents we saw in the Middle East and dramatised in the movie. Um, that, that, for example, is a role which doesn't actually really require uh, so much in the way of engagement with the third country. It's, uh, it's basically China helping its own citizens in far off foreign locations. But that is actually still uh, applies this narrative to the same degree because it is China demonstrating its international ability to uh, protect its own sovereignty. So that is one avenue in which this, this whole role can um, reinforce these perceptions of China without actually requiring, as, as you say, a, a disaster assistance presence in a, a politically sensitive country. Um, but the second uh, way that I would look at it is that we just have to remember the example of the United States in Indonesia. That in 2004, Attitudes in Indonesia, and particularly in Aceh, which is a more staunchly Muslim province of Indonesia, um, attitudes towards the United States were at rock bottom. Um, people would widely st state that the George W. Bush administration had, had zero soft power in the Islamic world and in Indonesia. And uh, Pew Research Institute uh, surveys indicated this. The, the percentages uh, were horrible to look at. Um, so that the fact that the US assistance arrived in Aceh, um, possibly the last place we would expect, um, and it was a, um, 
you know, an, uh, a complete success. And with these these polls showing a doubling in positive attitudes towards the US, um, um, sort of a, uh, an unprecedented turnaround in, in public opinion. Um, so it may be that, um, that in principle, uh, there may be uh, considerable skepticism towards any great power that comes to intervene in your country offering even humanitarian assistance. But perhaps people on the ground merely appreciate the arrival of, of you know, servicemen and women with supplies that they urgently need and the politics tends to get set aside. Um, so uh, we'll have to wait and see, but if, we'll, if, if, if the Indian Ocean tsunami was any example, perhaps China can overcome any uh, pre-existing uh, perceptions and turn them around with, with its assistance. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank Richard uh, for a wonderful presentation, wonderful Q&A. Uh, uh, I'd like to also thank the Yokosuka Council on Asia-Pacific Studies. Is there anybody from YCAPS? Yes, here it is. So thank you very much for co-sponsoring this. Uh, maybe you can say a few words about YCAPS? Uh, or you can do it on camera too. Yeah. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Nick Millward, I'm the secretary for YCAPS, and I uh, just want to thank you for the uh, great opportunity we have to uh, come up here and support you for this, because this, uh, this was an awesome uh, and wonderful opportunity to hear from uh, such an esteemed um, uh, scholar. And then uh, we also had the opportunity for, uh, for this last Monday to hear from Mr. Tom O'Sullivan uh, and have a couple of the individuals here in the, uh, in the audience come down and uh, participate in the event that we had this past Monday discussing Hong Kong. So uh, again, thank you for the partnership that we get to uh, enjoy from, from working with ICAS.